with Slug Book. But they were soon sold after the show and they were never used for breeding. And now we're going to talk about the name. Do we call this dog the Werner Senkund or the Durbachund? In his report about the show in Lucerne in 1907, Heim used an incorrect spelling and wrote Derbach and Bachler Hund, which had to be corrected by some of the club members. So he proposed to change the name into Berner, Berner Seven Hund instead of Derbach Dog to the breeders who were at the show in 1908. Heim always thought the club had done so, but actually they didn't. Um, the answer of the club could soon be read in a publication that appeared in September 1908. We hope that at further shows of the Swiss Kennel Club, our darlings will be named with their proper name. The name which was decided on by the club after a long debate is Durbachum. Notice that Dr. Heim believed it was Bernie's uh, Bernard Senehund. <laughs> with respect to the place and region where the breed was preserved cleanest of all, as far as the name is concerned, there is nothing to improve, but as for the breed, there lies ahead many years of hard work until these dogs look the way the breed standard requires. The consequence was that for many years, both terms were used in publications of the club. They used Durbach Hoon, and in publications of the SCS, Berner Senenhoon was used. In 1912, the club used Berner Senenhoon Club, the first time in an official paper. Even today, older people living in the camp of Berner use the term Durbach for whenever they see a Berner's mouth And now we're going to talk a little bit about the club, and I, I don't expect you guys to read that. This is one of the very first early Swiss standards. Um, four months after the gentlemen of Bergdorf had met Heim, they came together to take a further important step. On November 15, 1907, they established the Schweizer Durbach Club. If we look back at the article on the formation of the Durbach Club, we will notice that it was published four months after the event and that it was written by a member of the editorial staff of the Central Block, not by someone of the new club. And this is also where they began to come up with the first breed standard. <coughs> so we're going to talk about if burners were ever close to being extinct. And this is actually a French book play from uh, the 20s. In the summer of 1907, Tagney published a book on poultry and dog science, in which he gave descriptions of several known breeds, amongst which he depicted the burner Senegum, with a breed standard of his own and a list of seven breeders. We learned from Tagman that the Durbacco dogs were still very, very common in the country. Albert Heim was a little bit misled. He said that they were almost extinct and that, you know, by the time they were discovered, and it was a little bit overstated. Now, for some of those of you who know me, you know that I'm in marketing. That's what I do for a living. It's a marketing play we often use. Um, not to be crude or anything, we lie sometimes to get you to buy something. We do. If you see the commercials from Viagra and other um, impotency drugs, most people do not get an erection lasting four hours. But if a guy who's having that problem hears that, they'll think, oh my gosh, if you could do that for four hours, it can certainly help me. It's a marketing point. You know, Albert Heim was trying to establish this new breed. He was trying to make the breed popular because he wanted more and more people to own them. So to say that they were almost extinct, what's that going to tell you? Oh my god, I want to go out and get one right now. And this is why we eventually got many, many, many dogs in Switzerland. So I do believe it was a marketing employed by, by Dr. Heim. Now, at the 1910 dog show um, in Bergdorf, the club put advertisements in the local papers that every person who would present a Durbach dog on April 24th in the fields beside the riding hall at Bergdorf would be awarded with a prize. 107 dogs were presented, of which 99 were considered to be true Durbach or dogs. Eight were excused for maybe not being purebred. There were no entry fees and very attractive prizes were offered. Hein recorded the heights in his judging report of 19 and a half inches to 27 and a half inches, noticing that many dogs were rectangular in appearance. 99 of the dogs were curly coated and eight were short coated. Hein was very critical of the curly coat and insisted that it must disappear in the brief. He was also critical of the excessive height. About 60 of the dogs and bitches were bred by or in possession of club members. About 40 had never been shown before and were shown by newcomers. They were invited to join the club, and eventually Heim came to the conclusion that the Berner Senenhund was quite still common in the countryside of Bergdorf and Bern. And this is actually what Bergdorf typically looked like in one of uh, a very old painting. Um, and this is the castle that overlooked the showgrounds. Now, some of these dogs that we're showing um, 
are shown here, and I'm just going to kind of go through them very quickly. We don't know a lot about most of them, to be honest with you. We just have the photos, we know where they were born, we know what their Swiss Kennel Club number is, but we don't know a lot about them. And these are some of the, some of the pictures that I'm sure you've seen in some other publications as well. Um, what do you think of this one? <laughs> Not an extremely pretty dog, <laughs> but it does look like a bird. This is not the original Berlin that we talked about earlier, by the way. <coughs> and this dog I love. I don't know why, I just love him. I think he's a very cute looking dog. And here we have Julia. She's a very sweet looking dog as well. And here we have Max. And a lot of these dogs look like some of the burners that we see today, actually. Um, and a lot of times you'll see breeders call them throwbacks because they're, they're basically a throwback to what used to be produced. Does this dog look like a burner? It was considered one. This is Rosie, and yes, she was definitely considered a burner. And she did well from what I know at many shows because I did do some research on her. One of the things you'll notice is that she has white that goes all the way up around her neck. One of the things I'll point out to you is that burners back then did look a little bit different. In the 1880s, 1890s, some of them even had red coats. Do any of you have a burner that's black and sometimes when it gets in the sun it looks a little bit red? That's probably where this comes from. Um, I don't know if she had a red coat, so I can believe it was black. Here we have Prinz. And then we're going to talk about Heim's opinion on DMVs and news. There are slight Newfoundlands that are very close to the Bernese Mountain Dog in their total form, although usually they have the more elegant, correct movement in third feet since they lack double dew claws. The head of the Bernese Mountain Dog also is reminiscent of the beautiful, noble head of a light, slender Newfoundland. If I were to paint on the latter the white and red markings, then it would be almost the ideal head of a Bernese Mountain Dog. And he wrote this in 1914 in a publication that he, he had published. Now, what's really interesting about this is it shows us two things. The Heim was a very big proponent of Newfoundlands, and he was heavily involved in that breed. But it also gives us a little bit of evidence of where Heim eventually wanted to go. Later on down the road, you'll, you'll hear a story of the dog that jumped over a fence. You'll hear this story. It was a new, if he jumped over a fence and right with a burner, we'll go into some detail on it. Heim really, really wanted to breed some new blood into the breed. Several reasons for this appearance, but also temperament. Notice I said that the, the Bernese Mountain Dogs were used as guard dogs, they were used as multi-purpose farm dogs. He wanted the dogs to be a little bit friendlier. Nukes were friendly, burners back then were not extremely friendly, so he wanted to change the temperament of the breed just a little bit. And real quick, I, I kind of skipped a section. The first publication of the Swiss breeds, and it's still the basis for most later writings, he wrote, Heim wrote this on the occasion of the National Exhibition of Switzerland in 1914, which, is presented, which was presented every 25 years in a big event for the Swiss country. It was a little pamphlet called Die Schweizer Sendenhuhn, and uh, the aim of this booklet was to convince Swiss dog lovers to part with the imported foreign dogs and to acquire and support their native breeds. Um, modern dog science has proved that some of Heim's views and ideas were wrong or exaggerated. And uh, he believed and proclaimed that the Swiss breeds, as such, were very old and that they were almost extinct. But, you know, we admire his enthusiasm for trying to establish a new breed and his dedication for dogs in general, especially for those doing a job and for the farm dogs in his home. And this is where I'm going to stop and show you guys something. This is kind of cool. Um, I brought part of my collection with me today. And one of the things I love to brag about in my classes is that I happen to own this original pamphlet. That was published called the Schweitzer Center. It's right here. So there's only five of them known to exist right now in the world. Um, there may be some in private collections, but there's only about five of them known to exist. Um, all my stuff is stored archivally, by the way. But uh, I felt pretty darn special for owning this. And my dear friend Margaret Barchi over in Switzerland happens to own one too. Well, hers has Dr. Heim's signature in it. Can't have everything. But at least I own one of them. So now we're going to talk about Isaac Schleiss. Isaac Schleiss was a Kansas farmer, and he lived in Florida.